show business with blood no. is um, it's something very unique. Some of the best boxers in history are in it. What prompted you to write it? Well, it got to the point where I was boring my friends telling <laughs> these stories and they weren't <laughs> believing me. And I would say, no, honestly, it's true. You won't believe this. And not everybody is into boxing. Mm -hmm. But I knew the stories were too good. And uh, so I was regaling people at dinner parties and people were a bit squeamish and uh, you're not really into that sort of thing, are you? You know, I thought you were into the ballet and what have you <laughs> and poetry and so on. But anyway, I had wonderful access over the years to boxing as a journalist. Yeah. And so I was, you know, more so than in rock and roll or, or politics or anything else, you could just walk backstage and, you know, and, and, and talk to people who had just gone through 10 or 12 torrid rounds of boxing. Somebody's trying to knock their block off and they're trying to do the same. And they just chat away to you. And the people in boxing, I just found them all wonderful, a wonderful community. And the amateur scene is fantastic because it's like the GAA, amateur clubs in every parish in mm. Ireland, mm. doing great work for the kids and so on. And I just had all these stories and it got to the point where I thought, really, I should try and put them all together. And what about your own interests? Were you a kid yourself when you became interested in boxing? Well, oddly enough, and that, that was one of the things that, that slightly surprised my friends, when I grew up in the 50s, hello, um, <laughs> my dad used to help out in the, lo with the local, uh, what, I was going to say, Brickham, but actually sort of curate, who was running a boxing club for the kids. And I used to think, because I was only learning to read at the time, that in fact, he was a coach, a boxing coach mm. and all that stuff. And he used to bring me along. So I got to lace up gloves, and in those days you actually did lace them up. And, and it had a powerful fascination for me. And around the same time, I wound up being very ill. I had acute bronchiectasis, and I wound up in Piedmont Sanatorium. Oh, jeez. And yeah, I was there for months. And in fact, I used to go to school there because they brought, there was a particular ward that had little desks, and some of the kids were allowed out of the beds would sit at the desks and the rest of us would sit in our beds. So I learned to read in, in Piemont Sanatorium. But as it turns out, my uncles would come in each week and I didn't realise this until I started thinking it through. They were always telling me these stories about boxing. Rocky Marciano, Joe Lewis, and then he did this and then the fella came out and I was hooked on this. But really what it was, it was like, it was what they call in boxing, kidology. They were basically trying to raised my spirits and I was hanging on for the second instalment mm. the following week oh, cool. and because I actually had been very ill I was anointed and all that stuff you know Jeez. I didn't know that later that in fact I was technically at death's door wow. oh my God. so I was only dying to get out and be a, you know get back to the gym with the lads I was only tiny oh my God! but boxing had this curious fascination yeah. and then obviously I wound up in a band and in music and so on and and people just assume because, you know, you're long hair and, <laughs> and you're, you're, you're writing lyrics and stuff that, you know, that you must be sort of a sensitive soul and you wouldn't be interested in that sort a of creative, thing. creative, yeah. yeah and, and, uh, but in actual fact, fact, the lure of boxing was always there. Gosh. Then you took all your knowledge and all these stories and all your experience and put it into this book, but you had to whittle it down to 16 mm. boxers. A lot of Irish boxers in there now, but you also put in arguably one of the best ever, Mike Tyson. Oh, Tyson, what, what, yeah, So yeah. what made you decide to put him in? Well, purely because I was fascinated by Mike Tyson as a boxer. Like the first time he came out, no socks, black trunks. Char the first time I saw him, that is, charged out of the corner and demolished a man, yeah. bigger than him. I thought, what, this, this kid's amazing. And he kept doing it and he became world champion. And I just thought, this is astonishing. Now he was a sort of, almost like an anti-hero to, to Muhammad Ali, you know? And, but I, there was something fascinating about that. And I, I was aware of his backstory that he had grown up in dreadful poverty uh, in, in, in Brooklyn. And, uh, it, it, you know, he more or less self-raised and he was lucky that he was saved and boxing essentially saved him. Now, we know what happened, you know, in, in his personal life. He went off the rails and so on. But, but he was in Dublin for a speaking engagement. And I, I, I was invited along, so I rocked up and I was talking to his agent. And we were just chatting in the corridor, you see. And we were chatting and the guy had been sort of a music industry person and, you know, and so on. So we were having a rapport. And he suddenly said, I think you should, you've got to meet Mike. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. But with that, he opens the door. Oh. And, and there's Mike. Oh, my oh God. yikes. And, you know, I, I was tongue-tied. And I went to shake hands, you know, the Bible said shake hands, because he went to shake hands, and I didn't know what to say. Like, like what do you say? <laughs> so I just had to say, uh, <clears throat> respect. And Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson took my hand, 
And he said, he started to go all lovely, right? And, and I said, no. I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he has a sort of a lisping voice. Yeah. And I said, no, 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 it's cool, seriously. And so we were doing this stupid thing, but I was saying respect, and he was thanking me. And his hand was incredibly soft. I have never... <laughs> Isn't that I've nice? never oh, shook a man's hand that was as soft as Mike Tyson's hand. There you go. And have you really shaken uh, Kate Taylor and Kelly Harrington's hands? Because uh, what, yes, they've I'm been fact, incredible. Yeah. I mean, how important are they to Unbelievable. I mean, Katie, I was lucky to see Katie boxing as a young amateur, mm. and her dad was incredible. He'd bring her in, and if she hadn't, she'd been boxing abroad internationally, but her dad would bring her in, she'd box in the stadium, and then he'd whisk her away. And mm. he was really training Katie, but she was a wonderful sports person, which was a great footballer. Yeah, but of she course, was a yeah. remarkable boxer. Yeah. I mean, Boxing, I, I look at boxing almost as chess. You know, you, you, you've got to solve a, a puzzle, a problem. And the problem is that the other person is trying to hit you. Yeah. You've got to avoid that. And you've also got to hit them to score. So amateur boxing is, is, is a little bit easier. Mm. But, it's, but Katie would hit people and they knew they were hit. Yeah. I mean, I saw one uh, international boxer who you know, had world titles and so on. She was virtually crying after the first round, because I was at ringside and I could see her eyes were glistening. But didn't Jeez. Katie do even more than just boxing? She brought female boxing into the professional era, right? She did, as she did, essentially. And, and she also was instrumental in women's boxing being brought into the Olympics and mm. acknowledged as an Olympic sport. Mm. Mm. And she went to Chicago, actually, to give an exhibition match for the, the uh, IOC officials. Mm. And um, she knocked out her opponent, which wasn't meant to happen. She was meant to do a sort of a, a demonstration or an exhibition match, oh. but she actually just knocked her out. Yeah. And they went, oh, well, this will be... So anyway, they went. But then, when she decided to turn professional, Brian Peters, who's a promoter in Ireland, out of Dunshockland, he said, look, you've got to have a proper promoter and we'll go and we speak to Eddie Hearn. And so they went to Matchroom and he said, I don't need another boxer. I've got loads of professional boxers. And besides, there is no infrastructure for women's professional boxing, because women's professional boxing, at that point, had this sort of air of a novelty events on men's shows. Mm. And, but he was so impressed by Katie mm. that he said, we'll do it. And then he sort of started to build up and then put Katie on big bills. People started to see her on TV, and then they began to realize, this, this woman can box, yeah. this yeah. is proper boxing. I have a feeling that even for fans, or for people who aren't fans of boxing, you're such a brilliant storyteller. Like, there's a reason you call it a show business with blood because it reads like entertainment showbiz anecdotes. Uh, it sounds like an absolutely brilliant book. Eamon, thank you so much for coming yes, in. Show business with blood is out now.